You are listening to the strongest podcast in CrossFit. This is the Type 1 Lifting Podcast. All right, guys, I want to tell you a little bit about Type 1 Lifting. So Type 1 Lifting is a clothing brand that proceeds of the shirts, the hats, and everything else go to the Children's Diabetes Foundation. This whole t-shirt company started from me taking care of a five-year-old girl from the emergency department at the Children's Hospital I worked at in Atlanta for a while back. Um, I thought I needed to do a little bit more than kind of just talk about my story. So this is how I started the clothing line because I wanted to show people that even though diabetics have this really bad disease, we can still do amazing things in our life and diabetes won't stop, you know, stop us reaching our goals. So go check out type one lifting.com. And, um, you know, if you have any questions, you can always reach me out on Instagram. It's type one lifting and hope you guys enjoy the show. Hey guys, we have a new sponsor for the type one lifting podcast. The company's called Liberté lifestyle. So Liberté is a French word meaning freedom, and the company was founded on the desire to have freedom to choose what we want to do with our lives. I actually had the owner, um, Nicole, on my podcast on episode 28, so if you want to go back and listen to her, um, she talks about how she started the company and what she wants to do in the future with the company, which is pretty cool. So uh, they actually have knee sleeves, wrist wraps, shirts, shorts. Uh, love the knee sleeves. I have the ice cream knee sleeves and I love them so much. They haven't, the neoprene's still good. Uh, the seams haven't split compared to other uh, knee sleeves that I have had in the past. Uh, and I'm planning to keep these for a very, very long time. So uh, Nicole actually gave me a promo code for you guys too. So it's all capital letters, T-Y-P-E and the number one. So it's type one. So go to LibertéLifestyle.com, uh, check out what they have in the store, use the promo code TYPE1, and save some coin. Now let's go to the episode. All right, guys, welcome to a new episode of the Type 1 Lifting Podcast. The pool boy is back for round two. So um, we actually talked last about you possibly going team, and you actually went team. Well, you were thinking about going individual, and then you went team. Well, yeah, I was, um, when was the last time we talked? I think like like three or four months ago. Yeah, three or four months. Uh, so, yeah, I was kind of in this situation where, you know, I was, I, I had left uh, the gym that I was previously at. So I kind of had this like not so, uh, I pretty, pretty much only had the choice of, of trying to go individually out there in the West. And then, um, man, crazy story, ended up being hooked up with it team way on the other side of the country being from california going all the way to massachusetts and now i'm going to semis I'm on a team yeah because i saw your instagram and you were at logan airport and i'm like bro like what are you doing in boston you're like a cali guy yeah. like what's the deal so yeah, and then you said i you joined a team and i was like okay whose team and it was funny because Lindsay, i interviewed a couple like i think a couple weeks before you you and vic's been on the oh, team cool. And Vic's been on like on my podcast, like literally like once a month. And so he was yeah. talking about the team too. So how, how did all of this like come together of you joining the team on the East coast? God, man, where to start. So it was a crazy story. Um, I was at the gym that I was at when I was last on the podcast with you. Uh, unfortunately I was, we kind of parted ways. And so I was in this limbo period of, you know, I had brought in some app, Actually, I had brought I had brought in three of the athletes that are um, over at my previous gym to be on a uh, a team for quarterfinals and potentially semifinals. But obviously, since we parted ways, I didn't really have that in the uh, front view mirror anymore. So it's kind of been this weird, just limbo period of like, what am I going to do? I'm just kind of still like searching out my options in terms mm -hmm. of a job. I had some like uh, I had like a pretty decent amount of gyms trying to court me in this whole process, but I wanted to seek out my best options and just kind of make sure I was making the right decision. And uh, long, man, and then eventually I had a mutual friend. I don't know if you know Liz Mullica. Do you know who Liz Mullica is? She's no. a photographer. Well, I had this friend, uh, Liz, who I had met through photo shoots that I have done, that I had done with, or missed it, uh, back at like Wadapalooza, not this last one, but the year prior. Mm -hmm. And uh, she kind of got the whiff of my situation, asked me, 
what my plans were in terms of the open. And I told her, I was like, honestly, I don't have an idea what I was, what I was going to do for the open. I'm probably just going to hit up one of my nearby gyms and just do the open there. And she was like, well, I have a friend out here in Massachusetts who's looking for a fourth person to join her team. Would you be interested possibly? And I was like, ah, man, that sounds like a pretty amazing opportunity. But unfortunately I don't have the financial means to just uproot my life and, and be out there for uh, the three weeks of the open. Cause you know, mm-hmm. by rule, if you want to compete under an affiliate, you have to be there for the, open, you know, all three of the open workouts. And uh, she was like, okay, well, let me just get you in contact with her anyways. And uh, you guys can kind of just go from there and just talk it out. And I said, all right, well, cool. So she ends up contacting me with uh, this girl, Lindsay. Her name's Lindsay uh, Grasses. Uh, she owns CrossFit 1977. And we were just talking, told her about my situation. And then she was like, well, I mean, I could offer you some classes to coach while you're here in the meantime for a means of income. And I was like, okay, well, that sounds pretty nice. So then I w- went back to my friend Liz, told her, I was like, well, here's the situation. I just, she offered me a few classes to coach, but I just don't think it's going to be enough. This is the kind of the barrier of entry for me. He ended up getting me hooked up with another amazing gym, a uh, beautiful community called uh, Carter Park CrossFit, located here in Chelsea, uh, Massachusetts. That that guy, I was talking to him, got me, uh, owner of the gym, his name's Koki. Uh, he got me a few classes of coach there as well. So then I go back to my teammates, talk to them. Uh, and this is all through like a, a group chat. Mm-hmm. Lindsay, other guy named Luke, and uh, this other amazing female athlete named Danny. And I'm telling them like, guys, everything's kind of lining up a little bit here. The only problem now is I don't, I, I can't spend like a thousand dollars on a rental to be out there for like three weeks beyond potentially. So then I get back into contact with the owner of Carter Park. And uh, I told him my situation. I was like, oh man, listen, I, I really would love to go out there. The only problem is I don't have access to it. A vehicle i just cannot spend a thousand dollars on a on a rental and he was like oh well you know what i happen to have an extra car that i can just lend you <laughs> so literally the stars <laughs> lined up i got coaching opportunities not only at lindsey's gym at crossfit 1977 uh, carter park crossfit but then also this amazing other gym in the marlboro Mar- uh, marlboro yeah yeah you said it right marlboro. <laughs> uh, area called uh, CrossFit Crag. They also offered me a few uh, coaching spots because I guess my uh, my teammate Luke uh, works out there periodically and his twin brother as well. So, man, the stars just lined up, uh, got the car, literally was introduced to my teammates on a Saturday, figured out all the logistics on Sunday, bought my ticket that Sunday night, flew in to Boston that I think Tuesday or Wednesday. I don't remember. I think it was a, I think it was a Wednesday that Wednesday. So literally what Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, like three days later, three, four days later, met my male teammate, Luke at the airport for the first time, (laughs) first time ever meeting him. Uh, Guy was amazing and let me sleep on his couch basically for two months through the uh, the three weeks of the open and and the uh, quarterfinal stage and literally met Lindsay and Danny for the very first time that Friday uh, when we did the open workout. Crazy, man. Complete strangers. And now they're like family to me. And I couldn't imagine uh, not meeting them. So that's the crazy, the crazy story. And we did the three weeks of the open. I decided originally I was going to fly back after the open. But financially, I was like, that fucking doesn't make sense sense because i had to come right back for the quarterfinals so i ended up just staying and living in boston for two months through the open through the quarterfinals and uh luckily we made it worth it and ended up qualifying in the east which i learned very uh hardly that it's or very hard the hard way that it's competitive as hell mm-hmm. here in the east so luckily it, it, it made out made out well finished 21st out of quarterfinals heading to now the semis, semis down in uh, Orlando, but uh, man, it's crazy though. If we were to, if we, we plugged in our scores on the West, we were 21st in the East. We'd be eighth in the West, which is a game spot, man. So they gotta like, they gotta fix something out 
out there. I know they're they're doing alloc like they're allocating extra spots to more competitive areas, but that's only for like the individuals. They didn't do that for the teams, man. It's crazy. The top seventeen teams in the world are from the East, and only ten of them get to go to the games. That's insane. That's yeah. insane. <laughs> but that's the crazy story, man. And and so I after the quarterfinals, uh, went back home for literally like a month and a half just to like, you know, I miss my family, miss my friends, had to do a couple adult things like. Uh, Ended up accepting a, an amazing head coaching position uh, over at a gym called uh, CrossFit LifeWorks, and uh, also had to pay my damn taxes and all that great <laughs> stuff. So it was a short trip back home for a week and a half, and now I am here in Boston. Just flew in a couple. Uh, what's, what's today? Thursday. Flew in yesterday at four in the morning. Uh, so my days are a little screwy right now, but yeah, so now I'm back. And so I'm I gonna stay here, train with the team as much as we can, and then fly straight to Orlando from here. So are you in Chelsea right now or where are you at? Uh Framingham. Framingham, okay. That's yeah, that's a little yeah, further that's... west west out in the city, but it's not too bad. Yeah, no, it, it worked out great because like Framingham is like in the dead middle, so like if I want to go if I had to go coach at uh Lindsay's gym or go work out with her, it boom, it's like a 30 minute drive, you know, I don't know, north, I don't know where the hell I am, one way. And then when I have to coach at uh, uh, Carter Park down in Chelsea, same thing, 30 minutes you know, the opposite way. So it's like right in the middle, worked out fine. And it's a beautiful drive. It's, it's really cool driving to Chelsea because it goes right through Boston. I get to see the TD garden. Yep. Uh, I get to see like where the Boston Bruins and the Celtics practice, the practice arena and stuff. So really cool. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a pretty cool. Uh, I, I love that city, but like the winter time sucks, but like summer springtime is top notch by far. I mean, the fall's pretty good. Once you go up North to like Maine and like New Hampshire and stuff like that. But you, springtime yeah. in Boston. You, springtime in Boston. You can't. You can't go wrong. Yeah, and that's where my. Uh, that's where Danny, my uh, second female. She she's in New Hampshire. So, um, and that's that's another thing that tripped me out about being here in the East Coast is everything is so close. Mm -hmm. um, so like literally just an hour away, I'm in a totally different state. So we'll we'll drive over to her gym because her gym has all the uh, important tools that we need, like the worm uh, handstand ramp is over there. So we'll we'll drive up there periodically to to use all that uh, fun stuff, and then she'll she'll drive down and train with us times too. Very cool. So was this your first time in Massachusetts, or first time, man? First time, and being a California boy, going straight <laughs> to the East Coast, dude. It's it's it took. I learned some hard lessons, man. There'd be like a few mornings where uh, I would go coach at Carter Park at like the five thirty a.m. class, and I'm like, fuck, dude, how do I scrape this ice off the car? I'm like using my bare hands to like get the snow off. Hands are like getting numb and, and stuff. So I had learned very quickly, go buy a snow scraper, a snow uh, shovel thing to wipe all the snow off. And it took me uh, uh, about a week. And then I kind of learned the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the ropes of living out here in Boston. Yeah. Were you but shitting yeah, your, the weather? Were you shitting so your the pants? Weather is the one thing, oh yeah. yeah. I definitely shat myself a few times, especially driving, driving in the snow for the first time. I was tripping balls a little bit worried about like you know swerving around on the ice and stuff but i after a while i got used to it pretty pretty quick so it was fine but the uh the one thing i learned a lot about being here is the weather is super bipolar mm -hmm. there'd be times where i'd wake up sun's out it's beautiful feels just like home like maybe 50 45 it's not bad at all um but then like a couple hours later clouds start rolling in starts raining and then when i'm leaving the gym it's fucking snowing again it's like it's just crazy yep yep yeah it's just yeah like i said like springtime and spring and summertime is probably like the best time but like the only problem is like you literally only have three months worth of like good weather pretty much pretty much there so. yeah luckily luckily i'm here uh, i was told it's gonna be pretty nice while i'm here pretty much so yeah, well, that's good. That. Yeah. So when yeah. you when you walked into uh, CrossFit 1977 with those like action figures painted on those walls, like what what did you think about the gym and everything? Uh, Lindsay will probably laugh because she really thinks her gym is like uh, kind of just you know not not too much to brag about, but I think it's a cool gym. It's it's got it's it definitely has a vibe, and uh, that's like one of my favorite things about just seeing other gyms around the country and stuff. It's just every gym is different. It's always cool to see how they do things. But yeah, the, the, the superhero mural, it kind of, it, it sets the, the tone and the attitude of the gym. I, I really dig it. They have an amazing community there. Beautiful people. 
And uh, like, I literally could not, I'm such a community person and I couldn't be more um, just humbled and just proud to be able to represent them and, and represent those people, getting to know them for the two months that I was here. Uh, they're incredible, amazing individuals. They were super sweet to me while I was here, super supportive of me. Um, and I, I just couldn't thank that community enough. So I'm really excited to go out and, and represent them at, uh, at the East semis this year. It's going to be, a, it's going to be a blast. Nice. Yeah. And in the, in the box in Chelsea too, is, is really, really done nice too with the, the brick. Dude, that is, a dope, yeah. that is, that yeah. is a dope gym. It's a really small gym, but they make it work and it's really cool. Um, because when I say small, it's pretty small. Like if we have a class of six or eight people, it, it gets pretty crowded in there. Um, and then sometimes I'll have a class of like 12 people and to like make them fit in that gym, like it, it somehow works. Uh, it's kind of beautifully set up where they're able to hang their rowers and their benches on the walls. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just kind of frees up a lot more floor space there. And, uh, but that's another, that's another really fun, uh, community to get to know and, and be a part of. They're also just super supportive and super, uh, super young and very like vibrant. Like the, the energy, the energy there is very young at that gym. It's a, it, they just had their five year, uh, anniversary, uh, like the last day I was here. So I got to celebrate that with them. Super cool. Everyone there has literally only been doing CrossFit for like two, three years. Oh, that's cool. Been, uh, yeah, been training with their head coach there, a guy named uh, Damien, uh, goes by Coach D. Uh, he, another young cat, I want to say he's only like 25, 26. Uh, but the dude has got like so much potential. He's a young bull for sure. Stupid strong uh, guy. He just needs to like, you know, get a little bit more experience in the CrossFit world and He's got uh he's got some potential too if he if he keeps at it. So it's been really cool getting to know both communities. They're awesome people there. Yeah. So when when you coach, like obviously you're a new coach at like all these jams. So how do you kind of, you know, run the classes and like make sure that these people actually like you know, know that you're talk you know that know that that what you're talking about is correct, pretty much. I mean, having my experience. I mean, I've been coaching since 2015, so it's pretty. I mean, I'm sure you can attest to this too, but it's pretty easy to recognize a young coach versus a, an experienced coach right off the bat. So I, I go into it pretty confident. Um, I don't, I don't ever get really too nervous in terms of being in a new situation like that. Uh, I'm a pretty extroverted person, so it, it doesn't take much for me to want to just kind of like stand out and, and and be basically the commanding figure of a room. So. It's kind of cool being able to bring my just ways of coaching and, and how I kind of do things. And uh, I think they all appreciate it very much. I, I kind of stole this idea from that I originally first saw from a, a coach up at my other gym uh, that I used to be at. Her name's Brittany Brooks, stud uh, Olympic weightlifter. She had this fun way of kind of just setting the tone of the class. She'd always mm -hmm. have something what she calls a, a question of the day where she just... It has everyone introduce themselves, even if they all already know each other. And then she'll just always have like a random question of the day just to have them just, you know, kind of a good icebreaker for the day. So I kind of took that and uh, started implementing it at the gyms here because I'm like, well, one, I'm the new guy here. I don't know any of these people. Uh, I want them to get to know me a little bit too. So it was kind of an easy way and fun way for me to one, remember their names because I'm really bad at remembering people's names. So I'd always have them introduce themselves. And then uh, plus it's just a fun way for us to get to know each other, coach the, the members. And I think it was also kind of a cool way for them to get to know each other further. Cause I'd always have like just these quirky questions like, uh, Hey, do you think aliens are real? Or uh, <laughs> if you can take a time machine, one of my, one of the favorite ones is if you could take a time machine and go back to any historical event, what would you choose? So it was always kind of, on to hear people's answers and stuff so in terms of like bringing my coaching mentality to to a gym and 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 making sure that they kind of can trust me as, yeah. a, as a coach uh that's never really an issue especially once they like were asking me why i'm here and my reasons and i tell them like hey i'm doing the crossfit thing i'm here for the open trying to make it to the games hopefully the semis and they kind of like then get the idea that you're a high level athlete like right away they they just want to pick your brain and, and trust that you know what you're talking about stuff. If you're out here competing, you know, yeah. taking your life, you know, to move across the country for it.
Yeah. So do you do like any of your, um, you know, your clients or whatever, when you're coaching the class, do they talk about like, you know, what does it take to be in the CrossFit, you know, games at all? Or like, do they have like any ambitions of doing that other than like that uh, coach D? Yeah, they never really express too much ambitions, but they definitely express a lot of the, uh, man, what's the word I'm looking for? Like fan gazing and stuff where like, they would just like ask me about a lot of the things like mm -hmm. I've competed at. If I've ever met any of the uh, high at level athletes out there and stuff like that. So they would like, you know, ask me those type of questions and, and, and kind of like fanboy out a little bit on, on the uh, higher level athletes and events out there. Yeah. So did any of them, anybody like see you as a coach when they walk in, they're like, Oh shit, it's pool boy. No, no, no one, no one recognized me here. No one, <laughs> <laughs> no, my social media following did not, uh, did not bring me out here. Although um, embarrassing, embarrassingly enough, I did have someone uh, recognize me at the airport that I was at. Uh, what airport? It was the Denver airport. I had someone, I had someone come up to me and introduce themselves, and that was, uh, that was. I mean, it was cool. I don't want to say it was weird. It was weird for me because I just, I just think of myself as a, yeah, as a normal person. Like, why would anyone want to follow me on Instagram, anyways? But that was kind of a funny experience. So, so someone said there's like a, like a, the, like something going on in Denver, like a, some yes, ghost, someone some ghost thing? To my, yeah, someone brought that to my attention that the Denver airport has some kind of a conspiracy behind it. I didn't ask too much about it, but I, I, I probably should Google it later on. But it probably... I, I, you know what I think it is? So the horse, there's a horse that's outside the Denver airport. And there's also one, I think, in the Broncos stadium. So, and I, and a I think, horse? Yeah, the, the, like not a real horse, but like a, fi a figurine, like standing up with like, oh, his, okay. like leg, legs up in the air. So, I think what happened was when the guy was making those horses, I think one of them actually landed on him and killed him or something like that. Something like he, the guy died for like for some freakish reason. So, and I think that that's the horse that was, um, in the Bronco stadium. That's why his eyes are red, I guess. It's Cause the guy got killed from the horse. I, it's something like that. I, I heard something of, of that. It's like, you know, I, I can do the airport. Then? Well, I mean, it's the same, it's the same figurine that the Bronco stadium that's in, uh, on the airport. Interesting. I'm sure there's, there's probably more to it as well. Which yeah. I'll Google after we're, we're done. Yeah. I, done. so I, when I, I went to Denver to snowboard and, and I think, Someone told me that, and that was years ago when we went snowboarding. So I, I was, I could be like completely way off on that story. That's awesome. Yeah, I love conspiracy theories, so I'll probably dive into that. <laughs> what, what, what's the biggest conspiracy theory you like to uh, kind of dive oh, into? Oh man, God, so many. How? Probably, honestly, probably like I don't even know if you consider this much of a conspiracy theory. But I guess, I guess you can because I. I kind of low-key believe it because there's no other explanation for it but like how the pyramids were built like to this day we have no absolute idea how they took these two plus ton stones chiseled them out literally in the mountains of like the egypt africa area whatever and then drug them somehow through these mountains down into where they built the pyramids from somehow took these two ton plus stones and stacked them up on top of each other Literally, no one can explain how the hell they were built, and my only, and the the only explanation people ever really kind of come up with that is a, a little conspiracy and out there is that it was the help of some sort of extraterrestrial life form that came down and showed them how to do it. Yeah. So uh, speaking about extraterrestrials, so I was on TikTok and and uh, Jim uh, Joe Rogan was talking about this alien crash landed in Brazil in like 1996. And so this alien creature came out and he's like really slimy or something like that. Like he has like slime all over his body. And the guy, one of the guys that was trying to help him picked him up and put him to, to do some studies on him and kind of make sure he's okay. And the guy, I guess from like the saliva from the alien skin went into the guy's body and like pretty much killed him because it was like a complete like bacteria that they weren't even like exposed to. Or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, I, and like, I guess like now this place in Brazil or whatever, like they have like all these like alien spaceships and they have like multiple people that can like attest to the guy dying and like seeing that alien spacecraft. Dude, that's, yeah, don't even, don't even go down that rabbit hole with me. <laughs> I am such an extraterrestrial just nerd. And like, I want to believe that it's all real so badly. Uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the Bob Lazar story, but I dove in so deep into that whole 
uh, story of his, which is just absolutely, if it's true, if everything he said is true, that he really worked on some super secret aerospace program that was reverse engineering spacecrafts. Like, if that is all true, then, like, oh, my God, it's just, yeah, that, that stuff fascinates me. Yeah, I, I don't think the aliens want to come down to Earth now. They might want to wait a couple of years after all the shit goes through. Uh, what do you, What do you mean? I with feel like with like at, with like with like all this like you know war going on with like, like you know like Russia and well, Iraq. I feel, like that, you know? I feel like this is like the perfect reason for aliens to come down and, and check us out. I mean, we do it all the time as humans. We go out into the jungle and watch gorillas just fuck each other up, and and animals <laughs> do crazy shit. You know, it's almost like why wouldn't aliens come down to our area and be like, look at these fucking Neanderthals just blowing each other up. Like, why are they doing this? Like, this is fascinating. They're probably studying us the same way we study, go out in the wild and study, you know, animals doing what crazy fucking animals do out, out in the wild, you know? Yeah, true. You're right. You're right. Yeah, I could see that. So um, there you go. So a as as you're your first time and like you're, you've been in Boston for a little while, you actually been to a first Boston restaurant. So can you kind of <laughs> can you kind of talk about it instead of like Chili's and like Fridays and shit? Yes, man. My teammates. I was here for two months, two months and uh, literally only ever went to an Applebee's, Chili's, uh, Chipotle. Oh, God, I, I think those are the restaurants we ended up going to. And then finally, I got to uh, go to actual into the Boston uh, area and experience this absolutely amazing restaurant called the Capital Burger. Capital Burger? Cap Capital Grill? Um, no, not Capital Grill. I was told okay. that there's like a, a, a sister restaurant or something called the Capital Grill. Um, but this place is called the Capital Burger. And God, it was really, really good, um, and it and it made me happy because uh, they use like they 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 fry their French fries in beef tallow, and that oh, just okay. made me super excited because I you know everyone who knows me personally I try to stay away from like processed oils and vegetable mm -hmm. oils and seed oils and stuff. So to see that they use like literally beef tallow to uh, fry their French fries, I was like sold. Let's go try this place out. And so yeah, the burger was phenomenal. French fries, God, you could literally taste the difference in terms of like the oil that they used. I, I can't really describe it, but it just tasted cleaner, if that makes sense. Like it, the French fry still tasted like a potato, but it was still like got a French fry vibe to it. it the best way I can kind of just compare it to is if anyone on the West Coast has experienced in and out like those French fries, you can tell that they're like potatoes because they taste a lot like just a potato and they're terrible. Mm -hmm. Like I just, I think in and out French fries are just garbage. Um, so it's a lot, this place was a lot like that, except way better. That makes sense. I don't know. People from, from the West coast who've had an in and out will know what I'm talking about. Their burgers are amazing. Their French fries suck. Yeah. That, I mean, I, I, I see that as a lot of burger joints too. So there, there's one, yeah. there's, there's one place in Boston. You got to go. Well, actually, did you go into, uh, did you go in into Boston this Monday for Boston Marathon? Or are you kind of like no, no, away? No, I flew. I, I flew in yesterday. Oh, that's that's right. That's right. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. at like 4 a.m. But I, I was kind of bummed because I had no idea that the Boston Marathon was going on. So I saw like the like stories on my friends who are who are out here now, like posting the Boston Marathon, and like my roommate or the guy that I'm staying with, uh, my teammate, was telling me how um, I guess they it starts and. Or some part of it starts in Framingham, and they yeah. run all the way to uh, to Boston. Which mm -hmm. is, I mean, to drive from Framingham to Boston is thirty minutes, so you can only imagine how long it would take to run. Yeah, so that's it, pretty crazy. So I was a little it, bummed that I that I missed out on that, and and you know, plus just the history with the the Boston Marathon in general, and then with the like Boston uh, Marathon bombing that unfortunately you know happened. So it would have been cool to be here to just experience like that kind of like cool, really proud uh event that the mm -hmm. city kind of rallies behind so but uh, yeah unfortunately I missed it. it is the biggest drinking day in massachusetts other than st patrick's day yes both of those two are like the biggest drinking days in in massachusetts or well, would you say that's bigger than st patrick's day yeah i, I would say yeah because like there's there's some people that do the marathon like run where like all the bars that are on the marathon like route they'll go to every single bar till they get to Boston. 
Will they stop and get a beer and keep? Running? Yeah, they'll get they'll no no like no just like regular Joes just like that are not running. They'll just like go to go to a bar, grab a beer, then just drive down or walk down to the next one and just keep on going. And then like when See, you that's get interesting. when you get to like the final stretch, like um, on Boylston Street, that's like one of the biggest bar scenes around. And so like there's like that whole street down Boylston is like all bars down there. So it's like a huge drinking party down there. That's so funny. Yeah, I was told when I was here for I was here for St. Patrick's Day. I didn't go into the city for that. I now you don't want to bother. No, no. People, yeah, people are telling me people like people out here get drunk at seven a.m., eight a.m. I'm like, God, that's insane, man. Yeah. Now, now with the Boston Marathon bombing, I was actually working at the emergency room in Boston when that happened. Oh shit! So How that was, was that? uh so. So I was the crazy thing is with the with the bombing was so where where they set off the bombs was like literally smack dab in the middle of Boston and there's like five major hospitals around that area and so yeah. and luckily luckily like they they have like all these like EMT stations that were like right there when it happens so mm -hmm. yeah like we had I'm trying to remember I think we had like 36 people come in at once Wow, and it was just like any anybody that had like burn marks in their neck, like we into they intubated them because they didn't want their necks to swell and like stop breathing, so that like hard plastic yeah. will kind of keep keep their like you know you know throats you know stable to like actually breathe. And the guy the the well the person I took care of, he had his whole heel blown off, and then he was like he was like bleeding internally. It was it was it was bad. His like, heel is like his heel his foot. His whole heel like. We we, we put oh, him in man. a C we put him in a CT scan. It literally looked like the night sky with all these like little pieces of bone just like all over the place. And they and and I talked to the I talked to the surgeon that kind of like the orthopedic surgeon that did the heel uh, to fix it. And she's like, "Yeah, his heel's gonna be perfectly fine. We put everything back together again." And I'm like, "What?" And he's like, "How?" Oh. They just went piece by piece. Did like literally just like it was almost like a puzzle piece. They were like, "Do do do." That okay. is fast. <laughs> Yeah, and we and there was other people there with like the, their legs completely blown off, just like from the knee down, and they were on tourniquets, and they were like, yeah, like they were talking normal, they weren't bleeding out or anything like that. Just you know, it was it was crazy, crazy. And then we were hearing stories of like other hospitals getting bomb threats and supposedly and shit like that. So yeah, it was uh, it was quite an interesting day, like ten years ago. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Wow. Yeah, I remember I watched uh, the Mark Wahlberg movie, and that was like, man, I could only imagine experiencing that in person. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't didn't didn't maybe I'm, I'm messing the stories up, but didn't Jake Gyllenhaal play in a movie where he was like a survivor from the Boston Marathon bombing? Yeah, maybe I'm yeah, 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 yeah. So is that the same one? Yeah, yeah. I haven't so seen that movie though. No, I like I don't I don't watch those movies because like I've already lived it, so there's like really no point for me to see yeah, it again. And, and yeah, yeah, and and like there's a Netflix documentary for like the Zanayev brothers that actually did the did the bombing and and like my wife and I were watching it, like the first like thirty seconds, like the bomb blew off. And my mom my, my, my wife's like, No, I can't I can't watch this. Like I can't I can't watch it anymore. So we just yeah, shut it off. And I'm so like traumatic. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want to see that shit again. I mean, I've been there, done yeah. that, you know. Whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I could only imagine. Like, one of my favorite movies of all time is uh, Saving Private Ryan, and I remember hearing uh, when it first came out in theaters, like people, like World World War veterans, were uh, they had to like walk out because it was just that the whole D-Day opening scene was just way too realistic for them, and it was mm -hmm. just too much of a, of a reenactment that kind of brought back that trauma for them and stuff. So yeah, I could only imagine, man. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, like it's, it's not like really traumatizing. Cause like I, I, you know, working in the ER for like 14 years, it's just like, you kind of see the craziest shit ever. And it's just like, yeah. all right, what's the next craziest thing you're going to see pretty much. And yeah. It's just like, it is what it is. And kind of like, and so sometimes I, I, I like see patients as like, you know, people that die of like video games, like NPC mm -hmm. kind of people, like granted, I know they're real people and, and stuff, but like, that's the way I cope. I'm just like, okay, they're, they're not real. So this is just something yeah. else and just kind of, you know, go on to the next patient to take care of and stuff. I mean, everyone becomes like their own, have their own coping mechanisms and, and just have their own ways of dealing with stuff like that. You know, and it's like you become 
you know, as morbid as it sounds, you become numb to that stuff when you're in mm-hmm. that field and you kind of have to, you know, like I have a lot of friends that are like in firefighting um, and even like cops and stuff like that. And yeah, they'll tell me some like crazy stories and it's just like, well, you know, we've seen it so much that now we're just kind of numb to it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, since you've been in Boston for a good amount of time, do you want to stay there at all? Or you just, you just want to go back to the West coast when everything's said and done? You know, it's crazy, especially like going through my experience of like of, of leaving my previous job and kind of not knowing what to do, where I was going to go. You know, part of, part of being out in Boston for as long as I was is just me. Like, hey, what's out here in Boston? You know, I, I know, you know, Ben Bergeron's gym's out here. Some people were telling me that they were looking for a full-time coach. Uh, there was like another gym, a couple gyms out here in the area looking for full-time coaches. And uh, so part of me being out here for two months was just to experience life here, see if I can see see myself uprooting my life and moving to Boston and uh, potentially building a life here, starting a family, something like that. So, I mean, I'm, I'm totally, I'm not closed off to the idea. Um I mean, obviously, California is California. You can't beat the weather there. But yeah, <laughs> you know, I've li- I lived in California my whole life. You know, there's a lot of things I love about it. A lot of things that I hate about it. Mainly just the politics. Sometimes the people in California can be very fake. Uh, and that was one thing I kind of like got to experience here in, in, in Boston. People are a lot more like upfront and real with you. And I appreciate that a lot. So could I ever see myself out here uh yeah i could i could yeah i mean there's there's ton of job opportunities out there too so i mean yeah they're, there's they're, always they're, they're endless i mean shoot yeah. you could even move to georgia too if you want there's tons of stuff down here you could come come hang out so <laughs> yeah what part of georgia are you in are you so, in the atl or? yeah yeah I'm, I'm in i'm not in atlanta but i'm like i think like 40 minutes north of the city so there's a uh, lake there's a big lake called lake lanier and i live like really like right off that lake yeah nice yeah i know i've never been in georgia so maybe maybe one day i'll come out there yeah so um when with with the whole team when you guys got like set up and met for like the first time and started doing workouts um how did you guys would you guys gel like pretty quickly on like understanding yeah we we clicked pretty pretty easily man it it, it just it was almost like just four perfect puzzle pieces coming coming together There, there really wasn't ever any like butting heads or or personalities conflicting, you know, we just, yeah, we clicked right away. And it was kind of, we still kind of joke around like how surreal it is that we were just like literally complete strangers. And then a couple of days later, like here we are together on a team getting ready for, for the semis. So yeah, we're, I mean, everything's been going super well. We, we picked up the worm pretty easily together. Um, you know, I take the lead on that one and just how, you know, they, they feed off my communication communication skills very well with the worm everything's just yeah i mean we're super excited it's gonna be tough but we we know making uh we know that the games could be a possibility if we believe in it so we're ready we're prepared for it and we're just super excited yeah so how do you guys like handles each other's weaknesses through like the whole like workout Oh, uh, you know, like I would say Lindsay would be the one who would probably tell you that she's like the quote weak link, but yeah, but everyone's got, man, their own strengths and weaknesses here. Like I'm not exactly the, the strongest dude on the team and, uh, and Luke, Luke is, is pretty strong, but he wouldn't say that he's the most strongest guy in the world as well. But man, Lindsay and Danny, could they move a barbell? Like, holy shit. So where, where we lack in strengths, the girls kind of pick up, um, Obviously, I would say, like, you know, Lindsay would say some of her struggles would be with, like, the strict handstand push-ups, especially the new wall-facing variation. Um, but, I mean, those are things that, like, I excel in. Uh, Danny does pretty well in. So, we just – we complement each other well. Um, so, I mean, we're not we're not too worried about seeing, you know, things thrown our way. Whatever whatever is thrown our way, we're, we're prepared for it. So, um, so how do you guys like train throughout like the whole week? Cause I know obviously like, you know, Lindsay's a firefighter and coach and stuff like that. And you're coaching different areas. And I don't know what the other two are doing, but like, how do you guys like get together and train together? Well, we make it work as much as we can. Like, uh, you know, Lindsay, right. She works 24. So she's, so she's only gone for a day. And, and so she's around most of the time. So I'll go down and like, I'm going down there to work out with her tomorrow. Uh, I'm not sure what Luke's doing. I think Luke might be there as well. Uh, I believe sometime uh, 
soon we're going to meet up as a full four person team at a uh, Danny's gym and, and work on the worm and stuff. So, you know, we make it work. It's, it's really not that much of an issue. We probably train at least two or three times together a week. Okay. All right. Very cool. Very cool. So, um, with the workouts that came out, were you guys like pretty excited of what you saw for like the programming for the quarterfinals? For the teams? Yeah, yeah, for the teams. Yeah, yeah. I, everything was there. There wasn't any glaring event that made us like think that you know it was going to like hold us up or anything like that. I know Lindsay isn't. She she would say she's not the greatest like squatter. So, like, she did struggle a little, little bit on the front squat event, but even despite that, like, we still finished, I think, I forget, the top 25 in that event. So, we did really well in that event regardless. Um, i trying to remember what event two was. I'm already forgetting what the events are. Hold on. I got, I got it on my phone. I, I, I was prepared, so. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're a good dude. You're a good yeah. dude. I think the event two is the rope climb shoulder. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, it was, like, 400-meter row, uh, 10 synchro yeah, shoulder yeah, overheads, was... and one max rope climbs. Yeah, it's like, and like that one, I think we were a little nervous about it because we're just visualizing all the teams with like, you know, five, nine, five, ten athletes that are just going to be throwing up themselves up that rope. But we actually did a lot better than I thought we were going to in that workout. We had another really high end top finish. Uh, the dumbbell thruster shuttle run workout was, was another one we did really well in. I'm trying to think of an event. We didn't really ever have a bad, bad event. We pretty much finished even keel um, on all of our on all of our events. Like after the first, unfor like unfortunately with the teams, they didn't really have that um, those windows where you can kind of see where you are after the first deadline, second deadline, and then like know what you have to do for that final workout. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like the the individuals have the day one deadline and then they have like the quote moving day on day two where like the leaderboard really shuffles around and then from there you see like okay this is what i have to do to stay in the qualifying spot or what i need to do to get into a qualifying spot for that third day with the teams it was just like we just had that one deadline day and then this, that's it like the score all the scores are going to be due for the second one so we were a little nervous about that uh, because the first deadline window only had two workouts, mm -hmm. which doesn't really tell you much in terms of uh, where you're going to stack up in the leaderboard. Because I think the second and final window deadline had three workout submissions. So that's like the one that really is going to shuffle the leaderboard up. So we were a little nervous. I mean, we were, I think, 25th after the first window deadline. So we were in a comfortable spot. But again, three workouts can change a lot of stuff. Um, but we ended up moving up, I think another like three or four spots to 21st. So it was fine. We were pretty relatively smooth with all of our workouts, never had a really bad, bad workout. And we didn't really have a workout that we absolutely destroyed. We were just pretty even keel, which is fine. And, uh, yeah, now we're ready and we're pumped. Semis, here we come. Yeah. And you want to kind of keep like, keep like be even keel, like throughout the whole thing, because obviously like if you excel in one thing and then you don't on the other, that could really screw you up. So if you're kind of like, kind of like right in the middle, you kind of balanced, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. You know, even kind of just shows that we don't necessarily have glaring weaknesses or glaring strengths, you know, so hopefully we can kind of get similar events like that in the semis. We, we know we'll see, we'll see a lot of, uh, different things that unfortunately we don't really have access to out here. Like I know, man, I'd be shocked if we didn't see that stupid torque sled thing um, out there, which we don't have a torque sled around here. Um, trying to think of anything else. I mean, unless they throw anything super obscure. They're going to bring a snail. Yeah. You know, a snail at the center. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's possible. Who knows? Who knows, man? But yeah, I guess the torque tank would be the only thing I could think of that we don't really have access to, but from friends of mine that have used it, they say it's a pretty irrelevant piece of tool. Like you could only push it so to a far, so hard. Yeah. So yeah, so hard. Otherwise, if you try to go too hard, it pushes back on you more. And so everyone's only going at a certain pace. So you're never gonna pass someone on a torque, if that makes sense. Yeah. Unless they're just absolutely just not even moving it. But yeah, so I hear it's a pretty irrelevant piece of equipment in terms of implementing it in a competition. 
Yeah. So were you were you there when Vic was trying to measure the rope for 15 feet? Oh, dude, you, did you hear about that story? Yeah, a little bit. He talked about it in the, po- the other podcast, but like, I want to kind of like get your your uh, your view on it. Yeah, Vic, Vic's a good dude. Vic's a good dude. He was helping us out as much as he could, uh, being the alternate on the team, um, or one of the alternates, or at least you know. Uh, I tell him this still sounds bad. But I don't even know remember who our alternates were um, designated anymore. But uh, he was helping us out, supporting us, uh, supporting us as much as he could. Um, so he goes and measures, or at least tries to measure the rope without dying. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we had uh, this incident where, like, we were gonna record it, but don't ask me why. Don't ask me why, and, and she'll probably be pissed for me bringing this up. But Danny only recorded the bottom part of the rope; like, she didn't pan, pan up to like show the target or anything like that. So she only showed the bottom piece of the rope. So uh, CrossFit ends up messaging or emailing us saying like, hey, like you didn't show your whole full length of the rope. So your video can possibly get invalidated. So we were kind of freaking out a little bit. But uh, I mean, luckily CrossFit was just like, hey, just remeasure the rope, send us, send us, uh, send us in, and and we'll be good. So oh. we were sending in the security footage. We were sending in like a Facebook live footage that we did, um, and then we ended up going back into the gym, remeasured the rope for them, sent them that video. So we sent them like four or five different videos, just to <laughs> verify that we weren't cheating <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, I was convinced that we were going to have to redo it. I was really convinced we were going to have to redo it, but CrossFit let us uh, let us slide. Yeah. So, um, so Hannah Hardy told us a little trick that she used where, when she was working at training, training think tank. So they got a 15, 15 foot PVC pipe with the ruler on it. And so what they did was tape it around. Yeah. You tape the ruler around the PVC pipe and you just stand it up and say, Hey, here's 15 feet right here. Yeah. I don't know why we didn't think of that when Victor was doing it, because when we went back in to remeasure the rope for CrossFit, that's exactly what I did. I grabbed, I was like, oh, here's an idea. I grabbed a PVC pipe, took the measuring tape, taped it with this duct tape around the top of the PVC pipe and just held it up. And yeah, it was like, why didn't we fucking just do this in the first place? Yeah, instead of him putting up boxes and trying to climb up yeah. the rope with like no shoes on and shit. Yeah, it was sketch. Yeah, he was like holding on to the rope. The ladder <laughs> wasn't quite high enough. So he had to like literally climb the rope, hold it and just like stay there for as long as he could. It was pretty fun. Jeez. So he's a, good, he's a good dude though. He is. He is. He'll, I, I know he, I know he does a lot for around that and tries to help out as much as he can, which is a cool thing. So, yeah, um, definitely. So with those ice age meals that you got on your Instagram page, like how seriously, how long is that going to last you? Oh man, dude, God bless ice age meals. That was one thing. Unfortunately, I didn't quite have access to when I was here, uh, last time for the two months that I lived here mm-hmm. because I had, Every month, they send they send me a gift card and just allow me to order whatever I want. Part of my uh, sponsorship deal with them, so I had already put in that order back at home before I was ever even presented this opportunity with uh, with the team. So I had my meals there. So then, by the time I, I came out to uh, to Boston, I had already used up like my monthly uh, meal count, and they don't send me my gift card until I think like the first. Or, t- or second week of every month. Mm-hmm. So um, they sent me my my uh, next gift card when I was here, but I was already like prepared to leave like in two weeks. So I didn't want to order all those meals, risk them like not using them all up. Um, so I didn't get access to them uh, last time, but uh, I made sure I ordered them. As soon as I got home, have them ship out to um, to where I'm staying out here in Framingham. And man, those things are a lifesaver, life, absolute lifesaver. Because that was probably my biggest expense when I was here was food. I was mm-hmm. spending so much money on food, and I'm and I'm and I'm privileged to be a part of Ice Age Meals because I I forgot how expensive grocery foods can be um, because I've been blessed to just have these meals for me uh, since I've been part of Ice Age Meals. So great company, man. Those guys are awesome. They're, they're just super supportive in every way. Uh, I think they literally send me another uh, gift card to uh, order some more meals if I need some, because I think they heard about my situation last time, but 
super amazing company, man. So if you guys are listening to this, go support them. Order from them. Use my promo code or hell, don't even use my promo code. I don't care. Just go, just go support them. Yeah. And uh, also you, you, since about supporting, uh, Misfit has a t-shirt out with your name on it to support you. So you can go down to Orlando. Yes. Misfit athletics, man. Those guys have always been the most supportive, uh, amazing community to be a part of. Uh, I'm super blessed and fortunate to have Kelly, uh, a part of them as well. So our programming is pretty similar. So we get to kind of like help sharpen each other up, you know, no pun intended, sharpen each other's acts and just uh, be able to train together uh being a part of the misfit community and um yeah they they made a fundraiser shirt for all the athletes that made it out um kelly natalie uh talbert uh another close friend who was on the regional team with kelly and i she made it as an individual female um so she she was had a fundraiser shirt for misfit um so it's just a great community to be a part of man they the programming, not only I think, you know, I might be biased, but I, I think it's some of the best out there. Um, and they're just an amazing community to be a part of because they just will always help you out no matter what. Even if you're not even one of their top, like, athletes. Like, a lot of the times, if, if you're just, like, emailing them and being like, hey, you know, I have a team that made it into the intermediate division at Wadapalooza or, like, the scale division at Wadapalooza, those – still send out gear support them they're amazing yeah i mean their discord their discord page is awesome like you i literally get notifications like like it doesn't matter like two o'clock in the morning three o'clock in the morning like oh i did this oh yeah they're did that always one. chatting yeah they're always chatting in that group man it's pretty funny yeah that's a great great community to be a part of yeah I, I love it i mean i've, I've been worth it i've been with them for gosh like six years maybe six plus yeah, years yeah so it's, it's been and a while I've, I've done almost every program out there in the books, man. I've been doing CrossFit for so long. I don't know if any listeners here are OG enough to remember programs like the Outlaw Way. <laughs> yep, um, I've done that. Any yep. of those. Yeah, right? That's so old school. So I've pretty much done every single program you could think of. Invictus, Comp Train, uh, whatever the hell else out there. I can't even think of any. Uh, Mayhem. I've, I've kind of dove, dove into Mayhem a little bit. But, um, you know, Misfit's the one I've kind of stuck with the most. I've been doing it since 2018. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're out there listening to this, kind of new to the to the game, trying to get into the competitive field, or just looking to just find a, a program that's got a great community, uh, check out Misfit Athletics. Man, they're amazing. Yeah, I agree. They're, I love their program. I like, like, like you. I've done Outlaw. I've done Comp Train. I've done... Uh, Berg, Bergner strength. I've done their CrossFit yeah. like little like path, and they then finally shut it down. But like since I've been doing, I mean Misfit. I mean I I haven't lifted as much weight ever, ever. It's insane. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's yeah, it, it's pretty beautifully programmed stuff. And then honestly, it's what kind of slowly got me introduced to like what Zone Two was with all the yeah. app sessions. And stuff. Yep. So it's been super helpful. And then I still work with Kenzie Riley, and she's just absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so. It's been working with her for almost two years now. Yeah, Mama too. So and she still kills it. Oh, yeah, dude, she's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, when you're packing for Massachusetts, since it's getting a little bit warmer out, so like, what what were you packing from California back uh, to come to Massachusetts for a little bit? So I was more concerned about because again, I packed for for two months. I was going to be gone, so I packed so much shit. I ended up paying like both ways a hundred dollar overweight fee um on my suitcase so honestly that was like the one thing i was more concerned about i was like okay you don't need to pack nearly as much um so i was more concerned about just making sure that my suitcase stayed underneath 150 50 pounds and i was i was right on the dot i think it was like 50 and a half and they let me slide with my half pounder um but yeah one of the things was like okay it's not going to be as cold so you don't have to worry about bringing a heavy jacket or anything like that. So I just got my, uh, my sweater. That's pretty much it. Okay. And I also kind of hoping to leave a little wiggle room for extra goodies that I might see at semis when I'm there. Mm -hmm. So uh, when are you guys planning to go down to Orlando? I think that Tuesday. I okay. Yeah. So do you guys have like a hotel room set up and everything like that or? Yeah, I think we got a few rooms booked. I know my my male teammate, I think he's looking into an Airbnb um, still. So, uh, yeah, I think that's that's what we're doing. And then luckily, where we're staying, at least the hotels that we booked already, we're 
I want to say like a five, 10 minute walk to the venue. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And then plus it's so much easier on, on, on being on the East because the uh, tickets down to Orlando are way cheaper than what they would be if I was in California. Yeah. I mean, I could literally drive there. It'll take me about like seven hours. So <laughs> no, that's not too bad. Yeah. No. No, it's like going. It's like going to uh, Rosemary Beach. It's like takes like five or six hours going through like Alabama to like the Gulf Coast of you know Florida and stuff. So it's like I've done it multiple times. It's kind of easy. So nice. Anyway, are, you gonna, so, are you gonna be down? Are you gonna be I, down in Orlando? I haven't told my wife. I haven't asked my wife yet. So I'm just kind of. I I, <laughs> I, 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 I really want to. I'm like shit. I will sleep in my truck just to go to this thing because like I would love to just go down there and like you know see everybody and kind of like you know watch the whole thing because i i the only time i've been seen a live um live competition was the southeast regions when when uh when chandler smith when ben smith were doing that deadlift um and they were racing each yeah. other and so this is mm -hmm. when chandler smith like started coming into like the fold of like you know he's a he's a pretty legit crossfit athlete and i saw that and that was the only day i saw a competition yeah. and that was it yeah now now he's out in the west yeah, yeah, crazy. Or Van Vickers. Yeah, it would be cool, man. And then we could finally, you know, meet and connect in person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's yeah, like, be really cool. I, I'm like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to reach out to CrossFit to get press passes since, like, you know, I'm part of a, you know, I got a podcast and everything like that. And so, yeah. just they're so, I, I haven't heard anything from them at all. I'm, tr I'm trying to think. I only, I know people, I know they're being super oddly strict with like, photography and, and, and videography like i think you have to specifically tell them like who you're there for what company you're there for um so i'm not sure you know what i can do honestly is i can i can hit up andrew hiller and then see like what he if he's going to be there and if he is like how did he end up getting a uh, media pass and i can get back to you and see yeah, that process works. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I um, yeah. I wouldn't mind like because uh, I wouldn't mind like seeing like Gabe and like you know, everyone else from like that whole whole group of group of uh, you know friends that they got there. So and kind of yeah, you know, shoot the shit with them. So yeah, that'd be fun. Man. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm really yeah. excited for it. So um, so I know I know like I'm really excited for you for going down there too. So what what are you what's do you, what's the obviously making games is like the the end goal but like do you have like any goals to like you know get the team name like out there like out out in the crossfit space saying hey we're like we're legit oh dude 100 percent, dude honestly at the end of the day in all seriousness the games is the, is the number one priority i mean that's the goal but for me personally uh, and i can i can i'm safe or comfortable enough to speak for my teammates as well is at the end of the day we're out there competing for the affiliate top and at the end of it all it's the affiliates that are the most important it's the affiliates that matter it's the affiliates that drive the sport it's what keeps the sport going it's what keeps the brand of crossfit going so for at least for me and i know for Lindsay especially being the owner of 1977 uh i just want to make the community of 1977 as proud as possible to be mm. able to just see like hey our team is out there for the first time at semis these are the four who are representing us um i want our efforts everything that we do in those three days that we're competing to be a direct reflection of the hard work that those members put in at 77 um and i just want to bring them a sense of pride to be you know and just be proud to say like hey that's my gym this is what i represent um and that's for me honestly my biggest primary goal or even over yeah even over making the games honestly i just want to make that community proud they've done so much for me um in the two months i was there they were welcoming um, super nice, super supportive. Um, still kept in touch even when I went back home, asking like when I'm coming back. Uh, so if they ever do end up listening to this podcast, like I want them to know, like I just want to be out there and just represent them to the fullest, make them proud, and I want them to know that like yeah, I'm literally every time I want to quit when I'm out there, just remembering I'm representing 77, and 
that's honestly at the end of the day what matters. And, and I really hope more uh, just high level social media influencing CrossFit athletes would promote the affiliates more because it kind of seems like in the in the old school days, I know you remember it was kind of cool to be able to see what athlete was out of what gym and who they represented. But I, I feel like it's kind of missing in sport now where a lot of these athletes just compete out of their garages or just train out of their garage gyms. And there's kind of not much representation for the affiliates in terms of the individual side. And even with the, with the teams, it, it kind of just seems like, yeah, they're representing an affiliate, but it's kind of become more of like a super team dynamic thing. Like yeah, yeah. Even, even with the make the mayhem teams, those guys are always kind of switching around. Um, and then like, even with this new uh, proven team coming out of like East Nashville, or whatever Tia's gym, it's like, I don't know, do those people actually really go to that gym? Um, and I don't know, not to judge them. I'm sure they're probably in the community, you know, but I just assume that they're just there for a team, maybe not necessarily to go out and represent East Nashville. Like, I don't even think it's in their team name or maybe it is. I no, no, I don't, I don't No, I think it's like proven fitness or something like that, but it's crazy. Like I've actually been to that gym and it is like, it is enormous enormous oh, yeah. it looks beautiful. so so in like the back end where like the proven team is it used to be like an olympic weightlifting like station like area where like they have like all those like lifting pads jerk blocks and all that stuff and they completely mm -hmm. cleaned it out and made it put a rig on there so like like they can run the classes and then proven can just like hang out in the back over there and just like i think they maybe like rent a little bit of the space out but it's like literally two football fields together and it's Jesus. Just, it's it's and they literally on the on the um so when you walk in on the right hand side they literally have like a grass turf like all the way through from like the beginning of the whole facility all the way to the end of it yeah that's incredible yeah and yeah, it's that's crazy and you could literally like if you go outside to like where like the garage um the the doors are like you could see the t nissan stadium where like the tennessee titans play like literally like right right over the right over like the tree line yeah, that's pretty dope. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. But I mean, like, yeah. So I just, I, I wish more of the higher level athletes would promote the affiliates more. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, in all, a CrossFit will never admit this, but um, I I know more than probably most people know in terms of uh, the regards of like the affiliate numbers. Um, they're kind of hurting a little bit. And, and, it, and I just wish that like more of these games athletes would use their platform a little bit more to promote like, support your local affiliate, you know, or re-affiliate with CrossFit if you unaffiliated, you know, let's build the brand back up. Yeah. Well, I think the whole like Greg Glassman thing didn't really help out. And so, and it, then like people realize, like, I, I supposedly from what I've heard is um, all you need is people to like two people in your, in your, like your group to have the judges course and you could run the open in your gym. I, th I think you still have to be an affiliate. I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I heard all you need is like, cause I know uh, Neil Maddox is not affiliated and he has him and somebody else was a, a, cro a judge took the CrossFit course and were able to do the open at his gym supposedly without a video submission. Yeah, I think so. I, I want to say that was true for last year's open gotcha. the year prior, but like for this year's open, I, I believe they changed it back. Like they, where you were required to, if you were not going to submit a video, it had to be done at a CrossFit affiliate. Because I remember, uh, like, at home, back at home, there's a, a a gym out of Santa Cruz who is no longer affiliated. So they would always, for the Open, their members would go over to uh, Kelly's gym, actually Kelly's gym, CrossFit Up, and they would do the workouts there because they had to. Gotcha. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. So, um. Obviously, like the work, like managing the affiliates and like talking more about the affiliates and all the other people. What else do you think that, can ha that CrossFit needs to do to, you know, get that big, big gr gr group of numbers like they did in the open like a couple of years back? Do they just need to be more transparent and they need to be more transparent with the value that that they bring with that um, by affiliating with with the brand? Because uh, a lot of people didn't like. <laughs> I don't know if you kind of watched like the recent video of, of uh, Andrew Hiller, where I think he had 
I want to say her name's Emily Kaplan. I forget her name, but she's in charge of the CrossFit book mm -hmm. where she's, she talked about like the settlement that CrossFit ended up doing with the, uh, the NSCA. And it, yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. That they were suing, you know, so, and a lot of people didn't, didn't know about that process and, and how CrossFit fought using the money that affiliates would use for, um, mm -hmm. Their affiliate fee, they were using like that's what they were using to fight um, to make sure that like it wasn't illegal for trainers to promote CrossFit or teach CrossFit. Uh, I know the NSCA was trying to make it like illegal somehow for, um, I could be misinterpreting this, but it's illegal for like CrossFit coaches to talk about nutrition. And nutrition is like literally the staple of what the CrossFit brand is about and promotes. Um, so I think if like CrossFit was just did a better way of, of letting people know, like, Hey, these are the battles that we're fighting for you guys. So you guys can keep promoting the things that change lives inside the gym. And uh, a lot of people just weren't aware of that. And I think if CrossFit just did a better way or had a better way of just communicating, um, and getting that type of information out there to the people and affiliates, um, then they would understand that they weren't just paying a blank fee to uh, be affiliated with the brand every year. And I, and I, I did hear that they made their uh, cap program free for free, uh, which is cool. Yeah, which is really cool, and that's a that's a step in the right direction for sure. Yeah, very cool. So uh, we're getting close to the end. Um, obviously, I'm like. There's like final questions, but you've already did them, and like you probably nothing's really changed anyway. So, <laughs> so um, I, don't rem I remember something about me being dead. Yeah, my favorite movie was my well, favorite favorite something book because because no because like you said you oh, didn't yeah, read yeah favorite favorite yeah, book no. any uh, what's in your gym bag um oh, what was the other one in uh, gym bag and then like you know what do you want people to know you as and then like you know oh, that's right that's right people able to reach out to you so we'll just do the reach yeah. out to you part so where where can people reach out to you if they want to ask you questions about like affiliates or if they have a job opening for you if you want to take it in massachusetts or cali <laughs> so like where where can reach out to you if they if they need a coach or want to ask about like coaching the uh, easiest way is my instagram instagram look it's cool boy pretty simple I, i'm pretty sure i'm the only look at school boy out there so I, I pop up pretty easy um but yeah if you're ever in need of nutrition help or just want to follow my wondrous life you can find me there <laughs> are you going to change the uh the, the instagram picture any anytime soon at all or you, do you like that like ai design oh yeah no i like i like the ai I okay got this, I got this well. yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, well, thank you for coming on. Obviously, like I, I would like to have you more as a, as a regular, maybe you can come on with a touch and go gang once a month or whatever like that. We'll figure something out. So, but, uh, but yeah, that'd dude, be cool, man. yeah, yeah, dude, let's, thank you. Uh, let's, I'll definitely be down to like, you know, talk about post semis, man, or something. Hopefully, hopefully next time we talk, we'll be, uh, I'll be a games after or something yeah. by then. Well, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for it. So, but dude, thank you for coming on. We'll, we'll talk later. Okay. Of course, man. Appreciate it. All right. Dude, thank you for doing that.